Welcome to this video here on Debaku University looking at sex determination from skeletal remains. So you find uh, bones of an unknown origin. Can you classify them or determine whether they came from a male or female? We're going to go over some of the things to look for when making this determination. So first off, just a general overview. Uh, Informative features are based on biological differences between the sexes and even races. Males are generally taller and more robust than females. The pelvis is the best bone to inspect due to the differences in adaptations uh, to childbirth, with the female tending to have a wider pelvic region. So again, that's the ideal bone if you're given the full skeleton to look at, but there are differences even in some of the other bones as well. Looking at the skull in the mandible, for example, uh, we're looking at a male and female skull. If we look at them really quickly, you might say, well, they're basically the same. But what we want to look at is some of the details. Uh, for the male, the, the cranial mass is more blocky uh, and tends to be more massive than females, which are rounder and tapers towards the top. We're also looking at just the general comparison. If you look a little closer at these, the female having a little bit of a thinner kind of appearance overall. Uh, that tends to be a little more um, evident with the zygomatic bone, which is uh, more pronounced in the male skull, and that's basically kind of right under the eye here. The mandible of a female is more rounded. Uh, you can see that down here at letter D, while the male is a little bit more squared. Males have a deeper cranial mass, so here we're looking at the side look of the skull. Uh, e, the distance would be greater here for the male than the female. Uh, these are just, again, a couple quick comparisons between looking at a male and female skull to be able to tell uh, the potential uh, gender or sex of that individual. Looking at the pelvis, as I said, uh, probably one of the better bones be to look at because of the clear distinctiveness uh, between the male and the female. So keep in mind we have the male here um, on the left column and the female here on the right. And there is a multitude of differences. The most obvious is looking at the pubic arch here, with the male being approximately 60 degrees and the female being typically at least 90 degrees, if not usually 100 or more. We see that also evident up here, where that female definitely has that wider region than the male to aid in childbirth. Also have the uh, pelvic inlet being very different here. Uh, for the female, it's more round and oval, and for the male, it's kind of a little smaller and almost has more of a heart shaped to it. Uh, there's also some other differences. The sacrum uh, is shorter and wider and curved and more posterior in the female. And in the male, the sacrum is longer and more narrow. So again, when you have two to compare, these are some nice, uh, clear, and obvious visual differences that can be made. We can also use some of the long bones. So normally the long bones alone are not used to, um, to estimate gender. However, if these bones are the only bones present, there are characteristics that can be used for sex determination. Again, not the ideal bones to use, but if that's all you're given, we can make some inferences based on even just using long bones. Uh, using the humerus in particular, uh, here we're looking at measuring the humerus. There'll be a certain characteristics to look for, the transverse and vertical diameter of the head region. So that's kind of where it articulates is the upper arm here. Uh, the width between the epicondyles and the total length of the humerus can be used to help classify or potentially classify it as being originating from a male or female individual. We can see some of the measurements that would be taken here in the image. Now, characteristics of the male and female humerus, what we're looking at when we look at that transverse diameter, we're measuring it, uh, the vertical diameter, the width between the epicondyles, uh, the length of the humerus, we can see in general kind of this table gives us an idea based on the measurements we get uh, where it might fall and be classified. Keep in mind that there are some measurements that just can be, cannot be determined. This is why typically long bones aren't the sole source used for determining uh, characteristics of a male or female individual. When we use the femur, so keep in mind this is the strongest and longest bone of the human skeleton. Male femurs are, are stronger and longer than uh, female femurs, and the diameter of the head of the male femur is greater than that of the female uh, femur. So when we're kind of making that kind of comparison of the general length and diameter, um, the head circumference, uh, the weight, again, when we're comparing the two, the male tends to just be a little bit larger and bulkier in relation to the female. Looking at the characteristics here of the male and female femur, again, some of the same apply as we saw with the humerus. 
keeping in mind that there is still that undetermined uh, region there. Taking the vertical diameter of the head here, uh, the uh, bicondyl width as well, and the trochanter length of the femur is, are some of the measurements we would take for comparison. And we look at a database as well um, to try to determine whether the individual was a male or female, which can aid in the investigation process.